Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. If you love this watch, email me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. It's in the description below. It is your purchase and pricing email question line for buying this or any watch you see on any Watchbox platform. Please reach out to me directly. Email tmasso at thewatchbox.com for pricing. Today, we're discussing a late 90s special edition that was part of the Mammoth Suitcase of Missions series, Omega Speedmasters from that era. Made in 1997 and 1997. This is the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Apollo 16. So the mission being celebrated in this case is Apollo 16. You can see right there the shield or logo of the mission, as well as the names of the three Apollo crewmen. Remember, Apollo was three crew members. And then the watch itself is a standard late 90s moonwatch. So 42 millimeters in diameter in stainless steel, 14.4 millimeters thick. It does feature a hesalite or thermoplastic crystal. From lug tip to lug tip, it's 48.5 millimeters. If we include the end links of the bracelet, the total distance across the wrist is 52.8 millimeters with a 20 millimeter spacing between the lugs. We're gonna pop this one open, throw it on my wrist. And you can see that it has pretty much the same look this model has had since its predecessors debuted in 1968. The so-called moon watch, ironically, never truly flew to the moon. Those were all pre-moon watches. But this watch, the moon watch, did arise during the Apollo period and has subsequently flown on innumerable occasions through many series of NASA and international missions. But on my 16-centimeter circumference wrist, you can see it must have looked huge back in 1968. 42 millimeters is large today. Back then, it must have seemed mammoth. Taking a quick look, you can see that although it's not the thickest watch, it does have a little bit of an overhanging lip to its bezel, so it will get hung up underneath super tight dress cuffs. Jackets are okay. Now, the watch will fit on a wrist probably a 14 centimeter circumference if it's on a strap, but if it is on the bracelet with the broader end links, then it's gonna be a minimum wrist size of about 15 centimeters circumference, I really feel is appropriate. Taking a look at the bracelet, you can see it does have a conforming end link. It doesn't conform quite to the extent that a Rolex end link will, but it prevents a gap between case and bracelet. Now the bracelet itself is a combination of a dress style and a sports style. You can see it's almost a three link design like the Rolex Oyster, but in profile, these oval cross sections and then these polished intermediates give it a little bit of an elegance that you don't get on a Rolex Oyster. Now you can also see this is very much 1990s Omega, so removable links, though you have many of them, are fixed in place by pins and sleeves, so if you want to size this at home, you're going to need a block and punch. Another sign of the way we were, you can see the reference number of the end links in the bracelet internally, and it is a snapshot friction fit, so you can see there's a combination of polish and satin. The engravings remain deep and sharp. You pop it open, and then you can see that you have two anchoring points for the bracelet. So using your strap tool, you can pop the spring bar, move it in or out in case you're in between sizes with the bracelet itself. Some of these links are not going to agree with a lot of folks, so you have that intermediate setting using the spring bar adjustment so that you can make those small changes if you need them. Taking a quick look at the dial, you can see that it's warped beautifully with the off-axis distortion of the Hesalite. Now, a lot of folks ask why still use thermoplastic, basically a plexiglass, on a watch destined for space missions. Well, the reason is it's easier to scratch than sapphire, but it's much, much harder to shatter. So you can put a scratch on it, generally something you can remove with a pencil eraser, but what you can't really do is shatter it so that pieces start floating in zero gravity. And that has always been the intent behind the Hesalite. Avoid debris floating in zero gravity, uh, not just because it could damage equipment, but because it could very easily get into people's lungs when it's floating at the same level as the air they breathe. So we get this Hesalite. Now, the bezel is polished underneath, and then we have an aluminum insert on the top. The tachymeter can be used to gauge the speed of an object, such as a aircraft over a certain distance. Now, you could think of this as 5,000 or 50,000 units if you're good with mental decimals, but in general, it's calibrated to deal with a low-speed aircraft or high-speed cars. Uh, taking a quick look outboard, we have the famed liar style lugs. The pre-moon watches often had pre-moon cases, which were 39.7 millimeters. This is 42, and a lot of the extra 
diameter is in the form of these shear guards that help to protect the chronograph pushers and the crown. So the asymmetrical shear guard case that's larger in 42 millimeters is one hallmark of a moon watch. We've also got these lyre style lugs which have been part of the watch since the 10512 which was the first of the Speedmaster professionals in the mid 60s. So you've got these inward bevels and then you've got these polished outward bevels. You've got longitudinal satination through a rather thin case band and then that bevel in polish runs end to end. The dial is matte black with stepped sub registers. You've got your constant seconds, chronograph hours and chronograph minutes. Now although this is a late 1990s model. This was after the 1997 Omega conversion to Luminova, so you can see it does have a Luminova dial, and that is correct. We've got white varnished hands for high contrast, and that's another element that changed over the years with Omega. The absence of broad arrows or Dauphine hands or alpha style hands characterize the watches that are from the professional series onward. Underneath the case back, which advertises that some variant of the Speedmaster Professional family was worn on the moon. Well, we have the Caliber 1861. So, newly updated for 1997, it's a rhodium-plated version of the old 861, but it also goes from a 17-joule to an 18-joule arrangement, and it is still manual wind with a 48-hour power reserve, a 3 hertz beat rate, and then a combination of a cam, or coulisse, for function cycling, and a highly shock-tolerant lateral clutch for engagement. And I should mention that the cam operation here is so sharp that it's indistinguishable from a column wheel, and that's a testament to the industrial might of Omega and Lamagna. And it is m worth mentioning that this movement is still Lamagna-based. Rather than the old column wheel 2310 becoming the 321, this is the 1873 a Bausch that becomes the Omega 1861. So still Lemania based and still a wonderfully mechanical feeling manual wind chronograph. Theoretically water resistant to 50 meters, but this is now a vintage watch, so I wouldn't test that theory. Reach out to Team Also at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.